a number of you have seen that there have been a number of presentations of this Growth and Poverty Project, which is a big, wider project, the purpose of which was really to see what is the Africa poverty or growth. What's the, the story about the poverty reduction in Africa over the last, over the last uh, 20 years or so? That work, that's still in progress. The results are still coming. The purpose of this really is something I've been reflecting on for a couple of years, and some of you have heard me talk about earlier versions of this. What do we know from the current evidence? What can we say is the situation in relation to poverty? Very quickly, I'll say something about growth, but we all know that story. I'll say something about data sources for poverty, and, you know, Morton's issue about, uh, about data quality is, is very relevant here too. I'm going to talk first about non-monetary poverty, then monetary poverty, and then what do we think we can conclude based on what we currently know, based on the projects, on the results of the GAP project, which will hopefully be coming out next year, we'll hopefully know quite a lot more. We know the growth story. We know the recovery of growth in Africa since the mid-90s. That chart makes it look, look, makes it look sm small because of the scale, but the growth is quite significant. We know Radley, we know The Economist, we know these stories, we know the sort of explanations for African growth. What we know less about, I think, is what's happened to poverty. The purpose of what I'm going to do is focus on the 24 largest countries in sub-Saharan Africa. That's 91% of the population. That's pretty good. 20 out of those 24 countries have had positive per capita growth since 95. Only four those, those four countries have had negative growth experience. I don't think anyone doubts that those are countries which have been poor growth performers. Cote d'Ivoire, Congo Democratic Republic, Madagascar. I don't think anyone doubts that story. I know there's questions about how reliable the growth measures are, but 20 out of these 24 countries are growth stories. 11 out of them have increased their per capita income by more than 50% over that 15 years. Poverty. On non-monetary, uh, we all know about the demographic and health surveys, generally felt to be a good quality source of data. Broadly comparable between countries, broadly comparable over time within countries, but there are some issues, there are some changes in questionnaire, there are some issues about sample and so on, but broadly speaking, good data, accessible data, and of the 24 countries, we can say something in 21 countries of the 24 at two points in time. In other words, we can look at changes. There's only three that we can't. Monetary poverty, the situation is somewhat more difficult. Surveys are different between countries. They often change within countries, so there's questions of comparability between one survey and another. And monetary poverty, we really have to worry about prices. Changes in prices, differences in prices between different parts of the country, different months of the year, changes in prices over time. We've got PovCalNet, we've got the World Development Indicators, which has poverty information. I'll say something about that later. My judgment, we have comparable data on 18 or possibly 19 of the 24 countries, and the GAP project, as I said, will give us more. Let me start with the non-monetary story. There's lots of indicators we can compute from the DHS surveys. Let me start just by looking at under five mortality rates. Of course, there's far too much information in those charts, but the columns are sort of grouped by country, and mostly what we see there are stories of reducing under five mortality. Sometimes, uh, like on the right there, Malawi, quite sharp, Ghana in the middle, quite sharp and consistent reductions in, in under five mortality, but other cases like Cameroon, like Burkina Faso, uh, jumping around and not necessarily consistent trends. <coughs> Cote d'Ivoire is a case where under five mortality increased. Zimbabwe on that chart is another case. These, of course, are two of the negative growth stories. They also have poor outcomes in terms of under five mortality. There we have more countries that have done well in terms of reducing uh, 
uh, in terms of reducing under five mortality, like Senegal, like Rwanda, and so on. Then we have data on malnutrition. This isn't all the data on malnutrition. Uh, but broadly, again, this is the percentage of children underweight, where we have data at more than two points in time. Usually we have reductions, but not in Cameroon, not much in Benin, not, mu not in Kenya. So it's a bit of a mixed story. Yes, there's a lot of positive stories there, but there's also some less positive stories. We can look at enrollment, we can look at education, that increases everywhere, we know that story. But it's not a 100% positive story, and I would say Alwyn Young's story, interpretation of DHS data, is rather too positive. Yes, this is a positive story, in most cases, most times, but not always. Vaccination goes up, there's improvements in many indicators, the rates of improvement are quite good. It's of, course not, it's, of course, not a meaningful comparison to compare it with the growth rate, but the rate of improvement of the under-5 mortality rate, the percentage rate of improvement of the under-5 mortality rate, is not bad. The non-monetary story, broadly, these are data which are comparable, which are broadly comparable, and where I think we can be reasonably confident about the conclusions. It's less strongly linked to growth, because obviously many other factors matter. Aid matters, public spending matters, effectiveness of delivery, all kinds of other things matter. But it is true that in two of the negative growth countries, Cote d'Ivoire and Zimbabwe, two of the worst cases, one also has worsening of a number of these indicators. Monetary poverty. This, of course, is a more difficult story. The World Bank headcount figures, of course, tell us that poverty fell in sub-Saharan Africa, even in the end in terms of number of people uh, between 2005 and 2008, as well as, of course, in percentage. What we're interested in, really, though, is the country-level evidence. Now, of course, again, the World Bank collects data. Povkalnet has dollar-a-day poverty, or $1.25, and so on. Well, Development Indicators also has national poverty lines. That, again, is far too much information, but that's just taking the World Development Indicators story on trends in poverty, again, grouping, grouping countries. We see some cases of quite sharp reductions in poverty. Uganda, third country from the, from the right. Uh, Ghana, about sixth from, the, sixth from the left, are cases of quite good poverty reduction. But Cote d'Ivoire is a story of big increase in poverty, so is Zimbabwe. Uh, Burkina Faso is, is, is a story of, of jumping around, but not of significant reduction. But that's with World Development Indicator data. And I think there are issues with this data source. It's not clear how these numbers are calculated. It's not clearly explained where the numbers come from. And also, there are issues of comparability of some of the surveys. And that, again, I don't think is sufficiently documented. So the method that I'm using is looking at carefully conducted country studies, looking at changes in poverty over time, and looking at national poverty lines. Nine of the countries I'm going to focus on were part of an African Economic Research Consortium project, which Eric referred to earlier on growth poverty linkages. And then there's nine other countries. Okay, we're missing big countries. We're missing Democratic Republic of Congo and Sudan and others, but what can we say? That's the story with the AERC case study countries, again, grouped by country. And we have some positive stories there. One has uh, six along, uh, six group along, again, Ghana, again, Senegal, positive stories. Burkina Faso, there's an increase, but then a reduction. And there's other cases, though, where poverty is not, is, not, is not changing, is not falling very much, or is jumping around quite a lot. Mostly, poverty falls here, but often the amounts, as in, as in, the, case of, um, as, as in the case of Guinea, for example, or, or Kenya, often the amounts are very small. 
There's other countries which are not AERC countries, but where I think there are relatively carefully conducted studies of change in poverty. Again, we have Uganda, we have Rwanda, stories of significant reduction in poverty. But we have other cases, we have Cote d'Ivoire, for example, where poverty increases. So the story is a bit mixed. Yes, there's quite a few reductions, some large reductions. More cases, most cases, I would say poverty falls, but the magnitudes are, are often small, often not statistically significant. So there's a number of cases there where the, where the changes are not statistically significant. Now, all this poverty data is specific to the years when the survey is conducted. Now, we had earlier, yesterday, we had the story of Madagascar, where particular shocks happened in particular years, and that drove very much the poverty story that was showing. We had the case of Rwanda, where there was a poor harvest in one, in one survey and a much better harvest in another survey. Again, that, to some extent, drives the story. The, the non-monetary indicators, I think, can tell us something more about longer-term evolution. This data, I think, tends to be specific a bit dependent on when the actual surveys are conducted. If we look at world development indicators, if we trust the world development indicators, we can add some more data to the story. I, I won't say more about that, but we can say something more about another two or three countries. Now, I think household survey data, as Eric also said earlier, I think the quality of the survey data is now not too bad in Africa. This doesn't have the serious problems that national income accounting does, though they're certainly far from perfect, but the process of calculating poverty is really complicated. And it depends every bit as much on the adjustments made to the basic consumption data, in particular for prices. The denominator matters as much as the numerator, and often there the data is very weak. There are issues of comparability. There are issues where the survey methodology changes and stuff like that. And then one questions comparability. And I think even in those studies that, that are used, even there, I think there are questions of, compar of, of exactly how the numbers were computed. Sometimes it's clearly explained and well documented. In other cases, it's really not very well documented. So I think this is a general problem, whereas with the DHS, one has relatively standard indicators which one can calculate relatively straightforwardly. This is a more complicated undertaking. The results are often debated. Mozambique, there's been a huge discussion, although actually the difference between the two camps is actually pretty small. Sometimes it's just inexplicable. What's happening in Nigeria, where there was apparently a very big, re a significant reduction between uh, 98 in 2004, and then a big increase in 2010. Then the new figures, which are included in the World Development Indicators, changed the story in 2004. And again, it's not quite clear what's happening. So I think there's still issues of transparency or lack of clarity about quite a lot of poverty calculation. The GAP study, the wider study, is based on a careful analysis of country data with broadly comparable methodologies. We don't have the final results. Some of the results, I think, confirm the stories that we had before, Madagascar, Ethiopia. But others seem to change. Malawi is an example where the message may be rather more positive than the official story. So the GAP study, I think, will add and will hopefully be uh, based on a more transparent methodology. So it was about growth and poverty reduction. To what extent does poverty reduction respond to growth? Eric talked about the growth elasticity of poverty reduction. Let's compare the rates of growth with the rates of poverty reduction. And I'm not doing anything sophisticated here. I'm just comparing the annualized percentage reduction in poverty with the annualized per capita growth rate. There are a few cases where the poverty reduction rate is greater 
than the growth rate. They reduced poverty over that period at a faster rate than the rate of growth. But these are very few such cases. These are cases where poverty increased. And those, the majority, are cases where, yes, poverty fell, but at a significantly lower rate than the rate of growth. Yeah, fine. So, in terms of translating this into a growth elasticity of poverty, what it's suggesting is that it's often quite low. I agree with Eric that I think the situation is better than it was 10 or 15 years ago. But the growth elasticity of poverty, I think, poverty reduction, I think is still quite low, based on the evidence we currently have. We have limited observations. We only have the years when surveys are available. We don't have a lot of evidence for the most recent three or four years, although we sometimes do. But in broad terms, I think the ability to translate Africa growth into poverty reduction is still a bit disappointing. High poverty, of course, may be part of the explanation. This is Martin Revalian's story. Is this lack of poverty reduction a story of increasing inequality? That there's growth, but there's increasing inequality. Well, I don't want to tread on Andrea's presentation. He's going to talk to us about inequality straight after me. But my sense of the data is that inequality in the data seems to fall as much as it increases. Now, that's for what the data is worth. Because here, I think, the data quality issue, I think, is really quite important. We know that richer people tend not to be covered in surveys, and that potentially could seriously compromise the reliability of the inequality data. I'm sure Andrea will, will have things to say on this. I think we need much greater clarity on the monetary poverty trends. I think the story is definitely positive. Monetary poverty has fallen. Some of these studies are much better documented, much more transparent, much clearer than others. But there does seem to have been monetary poverty reduction. But at perhaps still disappointing rates. The non-monetary story, I think, is more positive, often, but not always, and in a wider range of countries. The non-monetary story does not necessarily go in line with the monetary poverty story. So there are cases where non-monetary poverty improves and monetary poverty doesn't, for example. The non-monetary outcomes are important measures in their own right. They're relatively easily measured, they're important outcomes in their own right, and they're also potentially very important determinants of growth and potentially the growth elasticity of poverty reduction. But we have in the sample countries which have been good across the board, which have done well across the board. I've talked a lot about Ghana and Senegal. There are other cases in there, Uganda, Rwanda and others. But is this a case of institutions? Is this a case of policy environment? <coughs> often, it's, often it's other things as well. Fertility reduction is often a significant factor associated with both growth and poverty reduction. Nothing, saying nothing about causality, but that association seems to be in the data. In broad terms, I think poverty, poverty certainly is falling in Africa, but perhaps at disappointing rates. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andy.